Hello everyone on behalf of the Mindalia TV team, welcome to Mindalia live streaming. Today we have the company of Marisa Ventura, whom will be sharing her knowledge in this space that have been named What They Didn't Told You About Mary Magdalene. Marisa Ventura is licensed in political science. She's a plastic artist, writer, and researcher on the historical figure of Mary Magdalene. Before starting with Marisa, we want to remind you that Mindalia.com is an international nonprofit organization and that you can collaborate with us by liking this video, sharing it with someone that you know that can benefit from the content that we're going to be talking here today and by subscribing to our channel. We also want to invite you to participate with us through the active chat. Feel free to just leave us a message or your questions. Having said that, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Marisa. Marisa, welcome to Mindalia. The screen is yours. Hi, Mirna, how are you? Hello, everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me today to speak on behalf of Mary Magdalene. Okay, well, again, thank you very much to everybody for being there today. Uh, it's really my honor, it's uh, a big responsibility to put voice to Mary Magdalene and to share with you uh, her true story. Um, we know that she was the most uh, important disciple of Jesus Christ. She was a magnificent woman, and it's really a pleasure to speak on behalf of her today for you. Most people, when you ask them, who was really Mary Magdalene? The first answer, when you ask to anybody, the first answer is she's a prostitute, she's the repentant, she's a sinner. So just to break the ice, let me tell you that she was nothing of these uh, words. There is no gospel that mentions her as a prostitute, neither a repentant nor a sinner. And I will tell you how I arrived to all these conclusions and these ideas. So let's start for, by the beginning. And let me tell you that my passion searching for Mary Magdalene started when I was a child. When I was 12 years old, I had the opportunity and I lived with my parents during a couple of years in Germany. During a weekend, we went to visit the Palace of Versailles outside Paris. And the palace a dazzle me in such a way, blow my mind, all the things that I knew, what I heard, what I saw, that I start reading uh, the history of France because I fall in love with the kings, the queens, and um, with all the light that France had at that time in that period. And really when you start reading the history of France, it's impossible not to stop in the history of the Cathars. Who were the Cathars? The Cathar people were the descendants of the teaching of Mary Magdalene in the south of France. Because after the crucifixion, as I will tell you more details later, Mary Magdalene went out of Jerusalem as the rest of the apostles because they had to preserve their life. So she arrives to the south of France where she started her public ministry and also the place where she finally died in the year 64 after Jesus. So who, who were these people? Who were this Cathar country as we know it today? Well, let me tell you that the Cathar people uh, were known as good women and good men. They believe in free love, in the equality among men and women. They were a, a very peaceful people. They... Um, they live in the south of France, in the area that today is called like the Languedoc or Occitan. Uh, this is um, a beautiful and amazing place where you can go and you will see that the presence of Mary Magdalene is all over the area. These people, the Cathar people, the descendant of the teaching of Mary Magdalene, they believe also that the church was not necessary to be in touch with God. They also believe and they insisted in a personal experience, in a mystical and in a one-on-one -on -one contact. So imagine that at that time, the church was not happy with these people, that uh, they didn't need the church to feel that they are in contact with the divinity, with God, with Jesus. So the, the church um, rapidly recognized them as a heresy. 
So what happened? Happened that in the year 1209, Rome, led by the Pope Innocent III, sent a bloody crusade against the Cathars. And the mechanism of the Inquisition really made them disappear, as I would like to say, in appearance. Because if you go today to the Cathar country, because when, when you arrive to Carcassonne or to René Le Chateau or Montségur, the places where they live, you will see that they are alive. The Cathar country, the Cathar people, their legacy, the legacy that Mary Magdalene puts on them are still there, are alive. And um, I, I feel Cathar, I have to tell you, that I feel a strong connection with uh, the Cathar people. So why I tell you this? Because I would like to give you some references about who really was Mary Magdalene and what has she done after the crucifixion. Who was Mary Magdalene? It's important to say that she was a Jewish woman. And this is something important because Jesus also was a Jesus uh, rabbi, a Jesus master. And she came from a rich family. She was very well educated. She spoke Latin. She knew the Psalms. She was a very strong and independent woman. She followed Jesus. Imagine that she abandoned her family to follow her rabbi, that was Jesus Christ. And imagine in that, at that time, in the first century, that a woman abandoned her family to follow a man. She must be really with a strong faith, with a strong courage, because uh, she really challenge the status quo of that period because, because of love, because she loved Jesus and she decided to follow his master, her master. And she was originally from a fishing village. This village is called Magdala. Because of that, she's known as Mary of Magdala. This uh, village uh, is very close to Jerusalem and it's the, the place where today we can find the synagogue of the first century where Jesus goes uh, to teach, where Mary Magdalene first met him. And she uh, really has a, a strong legacy on all of us. Mary Magdalene uh, is usually recognized because three different things. First of all, uh, she is well known because she was the leader of the group of women that follows Jesus. She was um, his most important disciple, as we will see. She is also recognized because she was, during the crucifixion, with a prominent role. Um, we know that all the other apostles were no around. They were hidden because they were, of course, afraid to be captured, to be tortured, to be crucified. Instead, Mary Magdalene, together with the Virgin Mary, they were all the time with Jesus Christ during all the crucifixion. And the, the third and most important also role, because of them, uh, Mary Magdalene is well known, is because she was the first witness. Uh, she was the first witness of the resurrection. Um, so she was the chosen, the most uh, important um, role she had. Why? Because Jesus uh, decided to appear the first time to Mary Magdalene. And she was the charge during the minutes that she went to see, to tell the apostle that Jesus was risen. So, but I want to tell other thing that it's very important because I said, who was Mary Magdalene? But who was not Mary Magdalene? And I told that Mary Magdalene was never a prostitute. She was never a sinner nor a penitent. So where come the legend that, that says that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute? Well, the lesson came from Pope Gregory the Great. In the year 597, Anno Domini, on his homily number uh, 33, he uh, puts under the name of Mary Magdalene other two women, Mary of Bethany and uh, the sinner that was Jesus Christ's feet and dry it with her hair under the name of Mary Magdalene. So he decided to unify three women in one under the name of Mary Magdalene. And he decided to put Mary Magdalene on her knees, calling her prostitute, 
penitent and repentant, things that she never was, you will not find in any canonical gospel, nor in the apocryphal, never, because the apocryphal really give us more lights about the life of, of Jesus Christ and also Mary Magdalene and the apostles. Uh, so was the Pope Gregory I who uh, transformed Mary Magdalene in a sinner? And why? Because there is a reason. First of all, he decided to divide women between the virgin and the prostitute. And where are the rest of the women? Where is our place? So this is the first question that we have to think, why they put the women on her knees. And the second one, the truth is that in the first centuries of our era, uh, Mary Magdalene has a, a strong veneration. All over the south of France, she was the strong woman of the Christianity. And the church knows that. So they decided that Mary Magdalene was overshadowing the power of Peter. So they decided to, to put silence on Mary Magdalene, to transform her as a prostitute, to put her in a second level apostle or disciple when she was really the first one. Let me tell you that uh, there is some faith and hope that we must have because during the year 1962 to 65, um, the Vatican Concilium II took place. Is in this concilium where the church recognizes that Mary Magdalene never was a prostitute. It is written. The, the concilium decided to modify all the liturgy and they took the gospel of John. So they modify, they erase from all the liturgy the word a prostitute, penitent, sinner, repentant, disappear associated to Mary Magdalene. So they recognize the mistake they have done during centuries. In the year 1969, she was finally recognized as a saint. In the year 1988, the Pope, Jean Paul II, wrote a letter that it's called Mulieris Dignitatem, it means um, women that dignifies, where he calls Mary Magdalene the apostle of the apostle for being the first witness of the resurrection. So he said, among all the apostles, Mary Magdalene is the first and the most important. And uh, finally, in the year 2016, it was our Pope, our current Pope, Francis, who decided to rise the celebration of Mary Magdalene that is on July 22nd to the same level as the rest of the apostles. This means that now in the liturgical calendar, Mary Magdalene has his uh, festivity at the same level of the rest of the apostles. I always say, well, it was 2,000 year, years uh, that we had to wait to have justice, but justice at last on behalf of Mary Magdalene. So these are good things that I think that church is uh, giving Mary Magdalene the place that she really deserves, uh, the place as the first disciple of Jesus Christ, his um, sacred companion, as I would love to call, because they really love each other and they had a, a legacy for all of us uh, that is really very powerful because Imagine that in the first century to speak about love was very difficult, but they uh, together, and of course Jesus Christ with all um, his teachings has done really a miracle. And we are all together 2000 years after uh, their life, talking about them and trying to follow the way they have uh, marked and done for us. So. As I always said, uh, Mary Magdalene is a magnificent woman, very strong. His um, sacred feminine energy is all over the, the place. And if you want to feel her, you just need to connect to make this one-on-one -on -one connection that the Cathar people uh, show us that it's possible to do it. Okay, um, well, I, I hope that you um, enjoy to have just maybe some information that 
I share today with you, but I highly recommend any of you that have interest to read the apocryphal gospels, particularly the gospel of Mary Magdalene, the gospel of Philip. Uh, the, the gospel of Philip for me is one of the most important because Philip always said, they were three that always walk with the Lord, his mother, his uh, mother's sister, and Mary Magdalene, his companion, his wife. So I encourage you to read this gospel, also Thomas, because you will find more, more information and more light about this period of the, of the life of Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you for accepting this invitation to be with us. You have been in our main channel, in the Spanish channels, many times. And we mm -hmm. didn't want to miss the opportunity to have you here in English because we think that what you have to say is super important and it's worth, you know, a try. And you've done it greatly. We are gonna oh, start, thank you so much. <laughs> we're going to start with our Q&A, some questions that we have. So okay. uh, let's start. The first question is, what is the impact of a misconception of Mary Magdalene in the role of women in today's society? Well, it's an, a, a great question. I think that uh, not only Christianity has suppressed the feminine part, if not all the, the rest of the um, spiritual tradition. For example, we can also see that in the Talmud there is no reference to woman. All the women in the Talmud, for example, were the women of, the mother of, the sister of. Just there are only five women mentioned in the Talmud. Like and secondary these women, characters, right? Never yes, main, of course. Always secondary. Never Behind exactly. and on the side. Yes. And you know what? Why a, a second place? Because these women, as also was Mary Magdalene, they were women that um, challenged the statu quo. They break the law. They were women, strong women, that when these women speak, the men listen. And for men, it's very difficult to listen what a woman has to say, more in the first centuries. So despite, the, despite that Christianity with Mary Magdalene at the top, decided to delete the sacred feminine. The sacred feminine, uh, the energy of the women now during this period is coming out so loud that I think that we are living a new era because uh, we need to recover the sacred feminine uh, together with the divine masculine because we were born to be as a couple to, well, the reproduction to bring life between the union of men and women. So the impact at that time uh, was difficult. And I think that till our days, but now I think that in, in our time, the rights of the women and everything that is related to what the woman deserve or the place we need to have is on the table. Thank you. Um, in, within your research, I know that you have a vast collection of information regarding art. Mary Magdalene mm. is uh, very portrayed. Can you talk? Uh, can you talk about that a little bit with us about your yes. knowledge on art? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, Mary Magdalene is the woman most portrayed in the history of uh, humanity, together with the Virgin Mary. Um, you know, I have to tell you something. When I saw painters that has represented Mary Magdalene naked as a prostitute, oh, I, my goodness, for me, it's like to be in the hell because I cannot see this kind of art. But I understand that in the first centuries and when the Pope uh, Gregory put this uh, mark on Mary Magdalene, the art took it very seriously. And the artist start painting her naked, always naked, crying. We, we can find many, many different images of Mary Magdalene on art. Also pregnant, let me tell you. Also in the crucifixion, in the Noli Metanchere, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But also something important that um, I would like to mention, you know, that it's very famous uh, biblical passage about the wedding of Cana. 
Well, in many oral traditions, the wedding of Cana is supposed to be the wedding between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And um, why many people um, comment that? Well, because first of all, the Virgin Mary was, uh, she was invited. She was not a prominent role in a wedding, in this wedding. However, she said to Jesus, son, look, there is no more wine. And she said, okay, he said, well, okay, I will support. Then Mary, the Virgin Mary said to the waitress, do all what he will order you. So she has a role that is strange if uh, you are just like an, a hostess in a way. Yes, like a hostess, exactly. So, but because all of many, many other things, the, the wedding of Cana uh, makes reference to the wedding to Jesus and, and Mary Magdalene. As I always said, for me that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married is something very natural. And also Margaret Starbeer, that is a prolific writer about Mary Magdalene, uh, she has an amazing book that it's called uh, The Goddess in the Gospels. And she said that in the first century it was not a heresy to believe that Jesus Christ uh, was married and had descendant because uh, Jesus, um, said repeated many times that he came to put in practice the Torah, uh, not to avoid the law. And what said the Torah for a young people? when well, they said that the natural state of a young man is to be married and to have descendants. So the celibacy was imposed to Jesus Christ in the year uh, 1139. But previous to that, the church didn't impose the celibacy. So there is um, a line of investigation that uh, give space to this uh, belief, to this idea. Let me try to put this in English. <laughs> I'm doing my best here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do it. So um, she has been portrayed many times as the woman that was the companion of Jesus by very yes. prominent artists very famous yes. artist and it's kind of known that those artists they had information that other people didn't have they were very educated and sometimes they were in orders that managed different type of content than the normal people so what did they know and how did they know that how, what, how, mm -hmm. why why were they informed about that and not the, the common citizen well it's true what you are telling. Um, in fact, many of the most prominent artists like Leonardo da Vinci, um, they were part of the Priory of Zion. So many of them has access to all this information. For example, the last super of Leonardo da Vinci, you will not find any glasses, any grial, because everybody say, oh, the same, right? Yes, everything you want. But this was not that he forgot to put a glass um, because he saw that the real Grial was the, the womb of Mary Magdalene, the descendant that they had. So they had access to all this information because they belong to secret um, or mystery schools, or they had these secrets. They know about that. And we have also Caravaggio. If you see Mary Magdalene of Caravaggio, the ecstasies of Mary Magdalene, you will see that she's incredibly pregnant. If you go, uh, yeah, it's impossible not to see. Let me if, uh, continue, please. Yeah. Yeah, continue. Uh, no, no, no. Well, <laughs> well, no, no, but it's uh, incredible. My, and it's there. You just, you just kind of answered my next question, and it was uh, regarding the descendants. What came after yeah. the union, right? So uh, we, we know, or at least we believe, that yes, they were together. They had descendants. They procreated. And then they were hidden. That's something that yes. was swiped, erased out of history. Do you think that's in a in a way of just um well the let me again let me put this in English. You know English is yeah, my yeah. native language, but f in a way I kind of feel that instead of being something bad is a way of protecting your children. 
Because what would have been of them if people knew? It's, it, isn't that a way of, of keeping them sacred and safe and able to yes. live a normal life? It's like, you see, like Hollywood stars, they yeah. don't show their children faces. Imagine these type of stars. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, let me tell you this. There is a, a strong um, or, or very well-known and prominent researchers, different, that they has a theory. And they said that Mary Magdalene, despite that she is really uh, mentioned in the gospel, but it is less mentioned as we all expect. And they, there is a reason why they didn't mention more about Mary Magdalene. And one of these reasons is to protect the sacred lineage, to protect the descendant of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. So, and I can mention you, for example, the um, research of uh, Margaret Starbeard, or for example, I don't know if you or the people had read Holy Grail and Holy Blood, um, Michael Bychent and Lincoln. Well, they all have this um, idea that in order to protect the, the lineage, the descendant of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, they mention just a little bit Mary Magdalene in the gospel on purpose to protect them. So I, I think if you ask me, well, I can tell you that after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene arrives to the south of France. She didn't went alone. She went with Lazarus and Martha, um, her brother and sister, and well, with Mary Jacobe, Mary Salome, with Maximin, one of the 72 disciples of Jesus Christ, with Sidonie, the blind man that Jesus um, gives sight again, But also the oral tradition said that there were another uh, person in the boat. This person is very often confused with a maid because her dark skin. However, this woman, this little child was Sarah. Sarah was the descendant of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, Sarah is uh, very well known in Saint Marie de la Mer in the south of France. And she's also called as Sarah Lacali. She is venerated uh, for the gypsy people, most than other people. Uh, the church doesn't recognize her as a saint. However, the church tolerates her veneration, which it's okay <laughs> still. Um, Sarah has uh, the main church on, on her honor in Saint Marie de la Mer in this beautiful tiny town very close to Marseille and there is a, a whole tradition that she um, is the one that started this lineage this sacred lineage and the veneration of Sarah it's amazing and all the people that knows about the real story about Mary Magdalene in the south of France where she develops her public ministry everybody knows about Sarah Thank you. And, and yeah. it's super fun how you keep anticipating to my next question. I think we're flowing okay. amazingly. Because <laughs> how did you gather and all the researchers gather information? What's source? How can you actually um, follow a thread of historical facts of things that happened centuries ago? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, as I told, I, I start reading Uh, since and I was 12 years allow old. Me, allow me to interrupt you. Yeah. <laughs> really quick. And it's because probably people don't know that this is the work of like almost two decades of research. It's not that you are talking because you suddenly found oh. the magazine. You've been oh, no, studying no, no, no. with passion, discipline. You yeah. are, if we can say, an authority on the topic. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm an authority. Thank you very much. However, I have more than 15 years that I'm researching and studying the life of Mary Magdalene. It was an intense journey. I travel all over the places where she lived, where she lays the, her legacy. Um, I have access to so many material, manuscripts, uh, different kind of bibliography, I really have done a many, many years of research. Um, it really was, an, as I said, an intense journey that I, I have done um, regarding Mary Magdalene. Last year, I launched my, my book. I'm writing the second one. 
I had the opportunity um, to study in different uh, universities, you know, uh, and well, I don't know, I have this strong passion, so I have all my life looking for Mary Magdalene and finding her. But I think that if people want to make research and to know about her, you have to go to the places where she lived, where the, um, her relics are, where she is alive. So mainly the south of France, of course, Magdala in Israel and all the area where she has her life with Jesus Christ. Because there are two Marys, the Mary that was living with Jesus Christ and the Mary Magdalene after the crucifixion, where he developed an amazing ministry. She offers peace, she baptized, she took care of many people. She really spread the world, the original message of Jesus Christ. That was a message of love and of self-knowledge, of agnosis. And this is really what she left to us. And well, I, I studied during more than 15 years, as you said. Really, it's my passion and my life. And um, beyond the personal um beyond the personal passion, the personal satisfaction that this gives you, uh, what do you think is important to recover, to rescue the idea that we have about a woman that lived 2,000 years ago? How can that better our lives? How can that better society? Well, I think that um, it's so nice, your, your question. I think that if um, we want to bring Mary Magdalene to life, Uh, we need, first of all, to dedicate every day at least at least one hour to our spirituality. Because, you know, we have many things to do every single day. We have many information. We are in the era of the big data. We have our cell phones. We have many interruptions. But we need to have at least one hour to be in silence, uh, to read gospel, the gospels, or to read any kind of material that makes you feel connected with your spirituality in order to improve, to have better self-knowledge. Because if you know yourself and you can recognize the things that make you a good person, you can be better with others. So we, we will uh, have a, a better society, we will live more in peace. But I, I think that the key to bring Mary Magdalene is to remember her message of love, the unconditional love he has for Jesus. And then how she really uh, communicate uh, all her life, the message of Jesus, the message of love, and the message of, of well, improve our consciousness. Um, it's the, the way that we can be a better person and live more happy. I think this is the key. Thank you, Marisa. Let's close with something that I find really interesting. You mentioned our sacred feminine and how, you know, being on the knowledge of, of people like her that walk this earth and that live the life of legacy can, can definitely better our relationships and our understanding of the role of men and women. What can you say about it? What is, if someone asks you, what, do you talk, what are you talking about? What is the sacred feminine? What would you answer for those that are not familiar with the topic? Okay. Well, first of all, I have to say that I love to be a woman. I feel really happy to be, be born or were born as a woman. And the sacred feminine I think we can speak about sacred feminine always related to the divine masculine because we don't have to lose the idea that um, we were born as a, as a team, as a couple, a union, as a men and women. So we can speak a lot about sacred feminine, uh, about the sensibility that we, the women, have. Uh, but And it's, of course, for us, it's a, a something very important. But I think that for me, the sacred feminine always is related in communion uh, with the divine masculine. Because to live in, in the same energy, to have the same frequency, men and women are different. Uh, the men are like more oriented to, I will say something that is maybe difficult, to they are electric. And women, we have magnetism. So if we can 
uh, match these two things that it's possible? And how is how can we match through love? The love is the answer. Love is the answer for everything. Everything you do with love, it's great. It's amazing. And you have to trust in this. It's inside uh, every of us. But I think that love is the answer for all of that. And this is the, the most important part of our sacred feminine side to make the things we love with love and also to be uh, in this um, equality I, I don't find maybe the right words uh, in english to be with the divine masculine yes i uh, think equality is it's a proper word marisa thank you thank yeah. you again you gave us almost an hour we've been together for 40 minutes now And I want to give you a minute. How about a minute for you to give us your your last uh, mm. for today, last words for today? Okay. So first of all, again, I apologize uh, because if, if my English is uh, not as well as I would like, as good as I would desire. But um, for me, the challenge to speak about Mary Magdalene in other language that is not my mother tongue, I will do it. In any case, because it's the opportunity and I wanted to share a little bit the knowledge. I hope that maybe something of the knowledge I share today maybe motivates you to continue investigating, to continue reading who really was this amazing woman. And if I obtain this, I'm really, really happy. So I encourage you to read more about her, to open your ears and your eyes as Jesus used to call us, for those with eyes to see and with um, ears to listen, to open your mind, to see with new eyes, all the information. And I hope you enjoy this uh, this time. I really enjoy a lot. Mirna, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to speak about what is my passion, what is my mission in this life. Thank you. Thank you from my heart. Well, Marisa, if you are happy you did it, we are happier that you did it because this has been an honor to have you. Uh, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for allowing the Mindalia TV cameras to be a channel for your knowledge. To those that are watching, we want to remind you before we leave that Mindalia.com is an international nonprofit organization and that you can collaborate with us just by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, leaving us a positive comment or sharing this information that you know that can benefit of the content that we've been talking here today. We have nothing else to say by now, but goodbye and thank you again for being with Mindalia live streaming. Bye. -bye.